I have witnessed with my colleagues here an appalling and evil act perpetrated against the people of Northern Ireland. On the 15th of August, 1998, Omer in Northern Ireland was hit by one of the worst single atrocities ever to hit the province. People that I meet on the street every day call by their first name as those are the people who have been killed and maimed. I could hear screaming and I could hear alarms going off. And it was then that I looked down and just saw that my foot was just not there anymore. A 500-pound bomb exploded in the small market town on a busy Saturday afternoon. I had to go home and tell uh, Patsy and Sharon and Cathy that Aidan wouldn't be coming home. 29 people and two unborn children were murdered when an incorrect warning was given. The police sent people to the wrong place and everybody ran into the path of the bomb. And more heartache was to follow. We don't know where the bomb's going. There'll be a bomb in the next few days. The revulsion was so visceral against the real IRA that they practically went out of business themselves. The tragedy in Omer and the controversy surrounding it still run deep to this day, making this a crime that shook Britain. The quaint market town of Omer lies just over an hour west of Belfast in Northern Ireland. It was never really one of those places that you felt scared or that you saw um, evidence of the troubles really. It was a small quiet little market town and everyone seemed to get on. For decades the people of Northern Ireland have had to live through an age of terror known as the Troubles. The division in Northern Ireland is, is a classic political ethnic division. The best part of 60 years, the British government allowed Northern Ireland to be run by the Unionists. And the Unionist government ran the place in such a way as to exclude the nationalist minority, Catholic, nationalist, Republican, until the whole place exploded in 1969. What followed was one of the largest conflicts in the history of the United Kingdom, with residents from both sides of the divide affected by the relentless battling and bloodshed. For 40 years, every child here knew the sound of a bomb. And some children could tell you the difference between an AK-47 and a British SA-80. The nationalists want to unite with the rest of the people in Ireland and be governed as a single entity in the island, whereas the unionists feel they will be overwhelmed in such a government and that their only security of maintaining themselves as an entity is the union with Britain. And if that union is threatened, they believe they will be overwhelmed. Remarkably, though, a political milestone was reached in the spring of 1998, which was to change everything. We had the signing of the Good Friday Agreement in April, which I think set a lot of people's minds at ease that here, at last, we don't need to worry anymore about bombings or shootings. Uh, we've, got, we've got peace and... That's, as parents, that's what we were very happy about, the fact that we didn't need to worry about our children when they went out. Four months on from this historical landmark, the people of Omer were enjoying a summer's weekend. Suzanne Travis was back home on a break from university. For some reason, we must have had a lazy morning and we just stuck our time. We had to go to town that day because my mum was taking me into the travel agents to get my ticket to go back to Liverpool in September um, and so we decided that we would just go in in the afternoon that day. We'd done the shopping, we came back home and when I came into the kitchen I said to my wife, is Aidan up yet? And she says, oh yes, he's upstairs changing his clothes to go down the town to buy a pair of jeans. My eldest son Clive and I, we played in a pipe band on Saturday we went to Glasgow and we were competing. Everything was going fine, beautiful day. A lot of people from the Omi area were there and we were talking to a lot of people. As Stanley prepared for the competition, his wife Anne was back in their hometown, getting ready for a shift at the local clothes shop. Meanwhile, Michael, Suzanne and their families settled into their weekend. And Oma was gradually filling with people. With two weeks left of the summer holidays and a festival parade later that day, the town was bustling. He said he was going to pick up his friend and go down the town and buy, buy the jeans. 
I even remember telling them where to park the car so that it would be the handiest to the town centre. I always remember as he walked up the hall for the last time, he looked back and he says, I won't be long. We went into town. The first place we went was the, the travel agent and we booked my ticket. Then I remember we went into a clothes shop and my mum bought me a few bits and pieces for going back to college. As Suzanne and her mum strolled around the shops, Aidan and his friend arrived in town. As Market Street began to fill with shoppers, Anne was busy at work when some terrifying news triggered a chain of events that would change Omer forever. The police came in and told them to get out because there was a bomb. There was a bomb near the courthouse. So Anne and, and Geraldine, they walked down the town. And normally they would go down to the back of the car parks. We went over to a cafe. And it was why we were uh, having our lunch in the cafe that um, the police came in. I remember them being very panicked and said, you know, you've, you've got to get out, get out, everybody out now. There's a bomb in the town. The time is just after three o'clock in the afternoon. We followed the crowd. The police were telling us to walk down to the bottom of the street. But people were very calm, you know, nobody was panicking. I think we probably knew that we were... We thought we were safe, you know, that we were out of danger and the police had directed us down that end of the town. The length of time we were stood there, I think, started to become a worry for my mum. And I remember her turning around to me at one point and saying, you know, Suzanne, I think we need to... Should we just walk on now? Because we're not going to let anyone back up the town. We'll go and make our way home from there. She no sooner had the words out than it just went off. Omer, Northern Ireland. A bomb scare has put the town on high alert. As officers rush to move locals to an area of safety, a massive explosion is about to rip through the heart of the bustling shopping area. Michael Gallagher is working nearby in his garage. I was underneath the car when I heard a very loud explosion. I knew by the nature of this it was a long, rumbling, vibrating noise. I knew from previous experience of the bombs that I'd heard in the past that it was a bomb. So, you know, you just think for a minute and then I, I thought, I better go home. The first thing I remember was completely being covered in rubble. My initial reaction was, I need to get it off my face. I could hear screaming and I could hear alarms going off and I could see this person lying next to me um, who was obviously dead. At that point, I just wanted to know where my mum was. When I got home, I found my wife was starting to get quite hysteric. The New Eden was downtown and I said, you know, so the, the bomb will not be in the town or if it's in the town, the town will be evacuated. I met a few people from the city to me, Stanley, did you hear there's been a bomb in Omar? I said, no, I said, I heard nothing. We lived quite close to the town and then shortly heard the helicopter. We put on the TV and it said that there had been a serious bomb explosion in Oma Town Centre and there were casualties. I decided then to go to the hospital rather than the town centre. As emergency services rushed to the scene on Market Street, Michael desperately began his search for his only son. And when I arrived at the hospital entrance, there was so many people. There was an enormous amount of people, mainly with head injuries. There were some people were sitting, some people were just standing about. I didn't know the hospital that well. I just went into every room looking for Aiden. No one was expecting anything like that. Also, August is a big holiday time. A lot of our staff were off on leave. We had a weekend cover. You didn't really have time to activate things, so the casualties were arriving. Of course, people were just coming up in all sorts of vehicles. I didn't realise that the operating theatre was on the first floor. And I went into the theatre. It was just horrible. There were so few people in the hospital working and so many casualties and I went through every part of the hospital and I couldn't find Aidan. To 
Tyrone County A&E was now flooding with casualties and concerned relatives as weekend staff tried to take the strain of the disaster unfolding. There was a lot of shrapnel wounds from the car bomb and lots of people had serious multiple fractures. We had people with really severe burns, uh, people with major eye injuries and lots of people who had amputations. Meanwhile, on Market Street, the scale of the catastrophic explosion was unfolding by the minute. The 500-pound bomb had been detonated in a vehicle at the bottom of the busiest street in the town, in the location where everybody had been evacuated to. I could see my mum in the distance and I thought, right, I've got to get to her, I've got to get to her. And so your initial reaction is just to push yourself up off the ground. And I didn't have the strength to do it. Um, and it was then that I looked down and just saw that my foot was just not there anymore. And I hadn't felt a thing. Suzanne had been stood close to the blast and was badly injured. In the carnage, she was rescued from the rubble. I knew that I was losing a lot of blood. I thought, I just don't want to die, I'm going to die. This is it now, you know, I just thought, I just wanted to go to sleep. But then the doctor came and he rushed me, rushed me down um, to theater. As doctors examine the extent of Suzanne's injuries, she remains unaware of her mother's fate. With no news from the hospital, Michael Gallagher decides to retrace Aidan's steps. I decided then to go to the place where I told him to park the car, and that was a point that I knew that we were in serious trouble. One of the cars was Aidan's, and I knew that if Aidan could have walked or phoned, he would have contacted us to let us know um, where he was, almost collapsed at that point. As Michael's desperation intensifies, Stanley and his son, almost 200 miles away in Scotland, were trying to reach family and friends back home. I never thought once that, that Anne would be at the bottom of the town. I was beginning to worry because I said, you know, I mean, there's definitely somebody in here that I know. And this guy came over and he says, I don't want to alarm you, but he says, I think maybe your sister, Rosemary, who was a traffic warden, has been killed or injured. We then went back to the hospital, and in one of the wards, we found Ian's friend, Michael. He was very, very badly burnt, and I asked him where Aidan was, and he says he, the last thing he remembers is they were both walking down the, the middle of the road, and uh, they were joking and saying, you know, we'll have, we, we need to get out of here. It was like the shop front just exploded and he was thrown through the air. That was the last he remembers. As the evening drew in, pressure mounted to catch the perpetrators. And the chief constable of the Royal Ulster Constabulary, Ronald Flanagan, publicly and very definitely laid the blame with one group. I was there that day. I want nothing more than to bring to justice those who committed this terrible crime. The sadness is, of course, we know who committed this crime. Three warnings were given prior to the explosion to Ulster Television, the police and the Samaritans. But each call led to confusion. They mentioned the courthouse and two of the phone calls. The phone calls were certainly not clear. They were, in fact, they were deceptive. They didn't in any way aid the police to find the bomb. Officers were led to believe the bomb was going to be planted at the courthouse. They tried to clear the street as best they could. The result was complete and utter tragedy. People were actually moved with the best intentions towards the bomb car. As people tried to absorb this and find their loved ones, many relatives still had no definite news hours after the blast. Everybody was so worried. Somebody said, listen, your sister's not dead. She's been hurt. She's been injured in the bomb. My brother, he talked to me on the phone and he said, Anne Smith. <sighs> There's no way that Anne would leave anybody and any doubt that she was OK. So, uh, I went to pieces and naturally enough, and I just couldn't think straight. Anne McComb was now missing, having evacuated her place of work. As Stanley tried to take in the news, staff at Tyrone County Hospital were drawing up measures to cope with the sheer volume of people. Nursing staff from all over Northern Ireland appeared. If they'd been in the, in the area, they just came. 
we were told that to try and ease the pressure on the hospital itself because it was being overwhelmed, that they would open the leisure centre for uh, to deal with relatives. So we were able to redirect everyone. There's lots and lots of people there. At one stage, I went up to the police and I said, you know, we've heard a lot about the injured because the lists were coming in, the people have been transferred to different hospitals. Surely you must have some news about the deceased. I think it was around 11 o'clock. Clive was with me when I took the call. It was confirmed then. They identified Anna at the morgue. Clive knew. I didn't have to say anything. I mean, that's... I can say it now. It was the worst, worst moment in my life. It must have been about half five, six o'clock in the morning. I was taken into a room and there was a policeman and a policewoman. They started asking me questions and I just knew by the nature of the questions they were asking that it wasn't going to be a happy outcome. And at the end of that process, they, uh, they said, we, we have somebody answering that description. We're going to ask you to go to the temporary mortuary. I had to go home and tell Patsy and Sharon and Cathy that Aidan wouldn't be coming home. I couldn't even say the words. We just hugged each other and cried. mindless, evil people who do not care about the lives of this generation and the future generations. We will defeat them. The quaint market town of Omer has just been the target of one of the largest terrorist attacks ever to hit Northern Ireland. A car bomb has ripped through the heart of the main street, leaving utter devastation in its wake. With the casualty numbers rising, the local hospital is under enormous pressure. Suzanne Travis's injuries are so severe, doctors have to transfer her for further treatment. I remember the consultant coming over to me and he said, we're going to have to ask you to sign this consent form to say that we can amputate more of your leg because the wound you've received um, is messy and we need, to, we need to stop the bleeding straight away. So I had to sign that form then that night to give them permission to take more of my leg away. As Suzanne tried to come to terms with the extent of her injuries, she was still unaware of her mother's whereabouts. Meanwhile, police were faced with a crime scene stretching almost 300 metres, as well as hundreds of severely injured people. The golden hour period is anything from the incident happening uh, right through, shall we say, for the next 48 hours has been a very crucial period from the point of view of identifying where those people that had carried out the atrocity had gone to ground, where they had abandoned vehicles, and identifying the scene location where the device may have been put together. Obviously, securing forensic evidence that would have been on the people themselves before clothing was abandoned or destroyed, or any telephones or any other material that would have been there that could have been helpful to the investigation. As emergency services began the long and painful clear-up operation, political leaders from around the world went on record to declare war on terrorism. Two governments will work together and will do everything that is possible within their power to hunt down those that have been responsible for this outrage. In the immediate aftermath of the Oma bomb, both the British and Irish governments, Tony Blair and Bertie Hearn, were absolutely horrified. These evil people, these mindless uh, people who do not care about the lives of this generation and the future generations, uh, that we will defeat them. They believed that perhaps the real IRA had succeeded in spooking unionists. 
and saying, how can you sit down with these people? They're the same as the people who detonated the bomb. Um, th things haven't changed at all. It's made no difference. So the two governments immediately came together to try to calm unionist fears. They pulled out all the stops, bringing over Bill Clinton, and he visited the scene. They talked to people. Tony Blair, Bernie Hearn, all went to OMA and toured around, desperately anxious to tell people, look, this is a one-off. We were told by the police that no stone will be left unturned. Those people responsible will be brought before the courts and dealt with. With assurances flooding in, the families of the deceased and those injured took some comfort in the promises made by the political leaders. It was this group that had opposed the Good Friday Agreement. This was a, an act of madness to draw attention to their dissatisfaction with the way things were going. 72 hours after the attack, the real IRA claimed responsibility. In the end, the revulsion was so visceral against the real IRA that they practically went out of business themselves on a voluntary basis. Very shortly after this, they announced that there was going to be a ceasefire because they knew they had no support. They knew if anybody could get their hands on them, they'd tear them apart because of the, the dreadful scenes of carnage that were broadcast all over the world. This was the deadliest terrorist attack. Northern Ireland is in a state of shock this morning. The bombing had quickly become global news, and sympathy poured in as the residents of Omer tried to rebuild their broken town. For Suzanne, her torment continued. I was in intensive care, and I remember saying to Dad, you know, what about Mum, and, you know, what's happened to Mum? And he said that she'd also been to theatre that night, that she'd had a severe leg injury and an arm injury as well. She'd had operations on both of those. And he said that her eye was badly damaged. He then told me she hadn't woken up after her operation. Mom. It was a week before we knew then that, that she had come out of the coma. We were just all so relieved then, you know that she was awake. The road to recovery would be long and painful for Suzanne and her mother. They were among over 250 people injured in the blast. 31 victims, including a pregnant woman and her two unborn children, lost their lives. An arduous task now lay ahead for the police. The real IRA had claimed responsibility, but no individuals were being held accountable. Within the first three weeks of the investigation, had fairly well established who the main suspects were. By the following month, 12 men were hunted down and arrested, and key suspects began to feature. Republicans Liam Campbell, Seamus Daly, Michael McKevitt, Seamus McKenna, and Colin Murphy, all alleged members of the dissident group The Real IRA. And more information was to come. Something close to six million uh, telephonic records had to be searched uh, through our... so to itemise out or identify those calls that had been made um, to, as it were, the telephone, uh, the mobile phones that were used by those that were planting the device. The guards were fairly content that they had determined where the device had been put together, where they had gone from, where the car had been prepared and laid up, and how it had been taken across the border. The route that it had followed down to Oma, and again the route that they had followed uh, to get back across the border again. Evidence showing that the terrorists had travelled across the border meant police forces on both sides the Garda Shikona in the Republic and the Royal Ulster Constabulary in the North began their own investigations. We feel that there should have been not two separate investigations, but a joint investigation. That was not the case. These were two parallel investigations, and very often uh, one side didn't know what the other was doing because of the lack of trust. The involvement of two police forces should have created some unity. But in reality, it was fraught with problems. Following the initial arrest of 12 men, all were released through lack of evidence, and the investigation teams pressed on with limited leads. But five months later came the first breakthrough. The police charged Colin Murphy for conspiracy. Despite the possible breakthrough with Murphy's trial, the process was slow, 
and two years on from the massacre, victims and relatives were frustrated. But allegations in a television programme were to turn the whole investigation upside down. It was totally incredible. We knew that government couldn't sit back uh, after this because there were so many startling revelations. These fresh allegations called British intelligence into question, claiming that they had the capability of tapping into live telephone conversations. That was the first time that we knew about GCHQ, the government uh, intelligence listening station. Uh, that's the first time we knew they were involved in any degree in the Oma bombing. In fact, they had monitored a number of the phones, including mobile phones, that the bomb team that delivered the bomb to Oma were using. The capacity to monitor telephone calls has been there for a decade or two or more, you know. But what exactly was being monitored and monitored by whom and to what extent? I have no, no knowledge in that respect. It's never been conclusively confirmed. Whenever these telephones became live, GCHQ could then track them. This didn't just happen in Oma, this happened in some of the previous bombings. We just couldn't understand if they had that degree of capability, why it was not used, first of all, to try and stop the bombers, and secondly, if that wasn't possible, to apprehend them at a very early stage. This new information was damning and intelligence obtained did suggest they were listening in to the suspects on the day of the attack. But what was heard, and whether it could have made a difference, remains a mystery. In addition to this, was yet another accusation. The British intelligence <laughs> overlooking Northern Ireland and not telling the police force there what was happening. If truth lay within these allegations, detectives hunting the bombers had never been passed the information, potentially hindering the investigation once more. But why had such crucial evidence not been shared? Because of their rules and regulations, they did not share with the detectives. They shared it with Special Branch, uh, but Special Branch did not have the authorization to share that with the senior investigating officer that was investigating the Oma bomb. Angry is probably far too polite a word. We were mad. Actually, we were raging. With the criminal trial of Colin Murphy ongoing, and no other convictions made, some angered relatives and victims took the matter into their own hands and launched civil action against key suspects, whose names had now been rumoured to be linked to the atrocity for years. Liam Campbell, Seamus Daly, Michael McKevitt, Seamus McKenna, and Colin Murphy. As part of that civil action, there had to be a, a survey carried out of all the telephone networks, and then uh, this, is, this is where we as families learned that this information was available. As relatives searched through piles of potential evidence for their civil case, another blow was to test their resilience once more. Everybody I chased was not ordinary criminals, we're all connected with the IRA. And at this stage the real IRA had started, so this guy was basically a big bomb maker, that's all we ever done, made bombs. And I knew what he was doing, so I would give it to my handlers, I don't know where the bomb's going, there'll be a bomb in the next few days. Two hundred and fifty victims have been wounded and thirty-one people murdered in a bomb explosion in Oma, Northern Ireland. Despite assurances that the perpetrators will be caught, the police investigation has been dogged by rumours of mismanagement and a failure to act upon key evidence. Two years on, one man, Colin Murphy, is on trial, but nothing else has materialised. Now an IRA agent has come forward with a claim that could throw an already fraught investigation into turmoil. I met him just before the Oma bombing. I would say to my handlers, he's mixing, because I knew, because I mean, I basically worked with the guy for fucking eight, nine years. An agent who goes by the name of Kevin Fulton worked for the British Army, spending decades infiltrating the IRA and working alongside terrorists. His role was to relay vital information back to the authorities. Despite the risks, he came forward with alarming news. I knew what he was doing, so I would give it to my handlers. I don't know where the bomb's going. There'll be a bomb in the next few days. I'd say, listen, there's something big going down because they're mixing at night. Although the location was unclear, Fulton claimed he knew of a device being primed to be taken north of the border. This extremely serious allegation led to the entire police investigation being scrutinised. 
It seemed to me that this suggestion that the bomb might have been prevented would cause the men's pain, and they had the right to know whether that was true or not. The other thing was that if it were true, it would have undermined the Royal Ulster Constabulary. And if it were not true, then, you know, the good officers would be tarnished by an untrue allegation. Baroness O'Lone was the police ombudsman for Northern Ireland, an impartial body that investigated complaints against the force. Her team called upon the Royal Ulster Constabulary and began investigating Fulton's claims. The Chief Constable assured me of every cooperation. But the reality was, whilst we got cooperation from some officers, we didn't get cooperation from others in matters of intelligence, which is a very sensitive area. We brought computer experts over to sit down at the intelligence computers and we found a completely separate system with further information in which had not been brought to our attention. The police themselves had started a review of the Omer investigation. One of the things that he'd looked at was the intelligence picture around the Omer bombing and uh, this wasn't disclosed to us at all. Delving into this undisclosed intelligence was to reveal some of the most damning information ever to come to light. I found in it information about a telephone call which had been received on the 4th of August 1998. That was just 11 days before the Omer bomb exploded. And it said that there would be an attack on police in Omer on the 15th of August. And um, that had never been made public. Nobody knew about it. This was a long and detailed conversation and it actually named names and places and it talked about an attack with weapons. Separate to Fulton's claim, evidence of this prior telephone warning was hard to comprehend. The Ombudsman requested why this information had not been acted upon. The officer who received the telephone call on the 4th of August had acted properly. He'd gone immediately to Special Branch, telling them and taking the content of a 10-minute telephone call. And the subdivisional commander did not know that there had been a threat of an attack on police in his district. Why didn't they act on it? Why didn't they tell? I do not know to this day. As the investigation deepened, the actions of some officers became more confusing. One common trait was now emerging, the lack of shared information. This officer told us that had he known about the information of the 15th of August, there was nothing which he would have done differently. But he had earlier indicated that he would have put roadblocks around the small number of roads which allowed access to Omer. There was a requirement that the district commander be told of a threat to his area. And um, <clears throat> there was a threat book in which these threats were recorded in each police station. But the threat book was missing and was never found. The Ombudsman also found some of the force's special branch uncooperative. They do work together, but they, don't, they didn't all share things. I mean, it's come out in the Ombudsman's report, but I mean, it's, it's actually twice as bad as even the Ombudsman's report makes out. We looked at some 300 pieces of intelligence which would have been relevant to the investigation in OMA and we found that 78% of them had not been passed to the investigating officers, 22% had. Well, I think OMA was a watershed for the police services on both sides of the border that uh, informal ad hoc arrangements were totally insufficient. There were officers who cooperated so fully and told us everything they knew and there were so many of them who have said we knew that Special Branch had information but weren't giving it to us. The investigation was profoundly flawed. Formalisation needed to take place, the legislation, but procedures were adopted by the police service, uh, the exchanges of information, you know, that you had to harmonise communications. And we made recommendations for the uh, appointment of an independent senior investigating officer and a new investigation. As a result, these fresh findings fed into an ongoing review into the handling of the crime and further proof was to substantiate the claims made by ex-IRA informant Kevin Fulton. My handler, I knew he did everything by the book and that's it. I knew there was an attack that was going to be imminent in the next three days because you always use your bomb in three days because the, the fertiliser, the mix is fresh. Kevin Fulton's information on its own couldn't have prevented the bomb. In combination with the other intelligence and information which was available, who can say? It actually proved that Yes, I did give the information exactly as I said I gave it. You know, she found that it actually gave me my credibility, but it also proved that I was telling the truth. With the damning report complete, Nula O'Lone had the difficult task of informing the victims and relatives of her findings. We were reassured that everything was going to be done. The truth was uh, really completely uh, the opposite story. It was the most difficult thing I've ever done in my professional career. The findings were so bad 
the issues were so big and I had hundreds of bereaved, injured, traumatised victims and relatives to deal with. The sad thing is the vast majority of people out there never get to see this material. They only see the headlines in the newspaper. The Ombudsman's report provoked controversy throughout the UK, not least within some parts of the RUC. With six recommendations made, the response from the Chief Constable Ronald Flanagan was extraordinary. As a result of a rigorous, fair investigation, I would not only resign, I would go and publicly commit suicide. He was almost in denial. So it was a very difficult period for the families. The Ombudsman was saying one thing and the Chief Constable was saying the other. But in the end, uh, the families learned the truth that the police investigation had failed. With the original investigation begging so many questions, confidence in obtaining any criminal conviction was now at an all-time low. But the following month brought the first victory. Mr Murphy. Judgment was passed. After considering all the evidence, I hereby sentence you to... Murphy got 14 years. After a trial that lasted over three years, one of the original suspects, Colin Murphy, was found guilty of conspiracy to cause the Oma bombing. But this justice was short-lived. He appealed it and, and a technicality, and he walked free. He walked free. This devastating blow came in 2005, after Murphy had been incarcerated for just three years. Five years later, his sentence would be quashed altogether. Further reports and investigations were to follow the Ombudsman's, each looking into the failures since the tragedy. In 2006, a new suspect was charged, this time with murder, triggering one of the biggest trials in UK legal history. Colin Murphy's nephew, Sean Hoey, was considered to be involved in relation to DNA found on the timer for the bomb. After considering all the evidence brought before me, I hereby find the defendant not guilty. 56 charges were brought against Hoey, but in a spectacular court case, every single one was dropped and the case was thrown out. You may now leave the court. Making Hoey a free man. Which in my eyes was a shamble, a disgrace to British justice. But the families and victims continued their fight. It would be two years later when they would make legal history with the civil case they had launched years earlier. This is the first time anywhere in the world the victims' families have sued terrorists. It broke new legal ground. The civil lawsuit is a much lower burden of proof, 51% as opposed to 98% in criminal prosecution. That was the only option that we had was to sue for money, basically. In the end, we got a judgment against four of the five that we sued. Thank you. Two members of the family have agreed to make statements. There will be no questions, please. I think it is a tremendous moral victory for our families. We would like to thank the police in both Northern Ireland and the Irish Republic, our legal team and the quiet community for all their support. Thank you. In a landmark victory, Michael McKevitt, Liam Campbell, Colin Murphy and Seamus Daly were found responsible for the terrorist attack on Omer. Seamus McKenna was cleared of all charges. The family sued those responsible for up to £1.4 million in damages to be awarded from their assets. At last, these people have been held to account. Maybe they'll not go to jail, but at least there's been a court case. A judge has listened to the evidences and he has found a judgment against these people. But for those grieving, the fight is far from over. New evidence uncovered by legal teams representing some of the families could finally be the breakthrough for a public inquiry that they have longed for. I have a right as a citizen, a British citizen, to know why my wife was murdered in Oma. When there was peace in Northern Ireland, why was all this allowed to happen? I need an answer. A handful of suspects have now been held accountable for injuring hundreds of people and for the murder of 31 victims on that August day in 1998. But not one criminal conviction has yet been successful. I wasn't going to allow these people to stop me from doing what I wanted to do before this had happened to me. So I graduated with all of my friends 
I got a teaching job in Liverpool. All of a sudden, my life turned a corner, really, and started to enjoy things again, and ended up meeting Martin, my husband, and we now have a little girl. So a lot of positives have come out of what happened. For Michael and Stanley, their fight continues, knowing that the pain caused by their loss may never go away. Anne is always smiling, always looking her best. And there was, there was only one Anne. If I was to sit down and think about all of that, I really don't think I could get up again. It's too painful just to think that you uh, brought somebody up to be uh, a good, decent member of society, member of your family, just for no reason to be not here. We believed that our children would be burying us. The only conclusion that I can come to is there are people in high places who are protecting those who were responsible for the Uma bomb. We have the determination, not just here, but in the Irish Republic too, to take whatever measures we can to bring those responsible for justice. And more than that, we have a political process that has the overwhelming support of the majority of people everywhere. Together, people and leaders are moving Northern Ireland from the deep freeze of despair to the warm sunlight of peace. I have witnessed with my colleagues here an appalling and evil act perpetrated against the people of Northern Ireland. On the 15th of August, 1998, Omer in Northern Ireland was hit by one of the worst single atrocities ever to hit the province. People that I meet on the street every day called by their first name as those are the people who have been killed and maimed. I could hear screaming and I could hear alarms going off. And it was then that I looked down and just saw that my foot was just not there anymore. A 500-pound bomb exploded in the small market town on a busy Saturday afternoon. I had to go home and tell uh, Patsy and Sharon and Cathy that Aidan wouldn't be coming home. 29 people and two unborn children were murdered when an incorrect warning was given. The police sent people to the wrong place and everybody ran into the path of the bomb. And more heartache was to follow. I don't know where the bomb's going, there'll be a bomb in the next few days. The revulsion was so visceral against the real IRA that they practically went out of business themselves. The tragedy in Omer and the controversy surrounding it still run deep to this day, making this a crime that shook Britain. The quaint market town of Omer lies just over an hour west of Belfast in Northern Ireland. It was never really one of those places that you felt scared or that you saw um, evidence of the troubles really. It was a small quiet little market town and everyone seemed to get on. For decades the people of Northern Ireland have had to live through an age of terror known as the Troubles. The division in Northern Ireland is, is a classic political ethnic division. The best part of 60 years, the British government allowed Northern Ireland to be run by the Unionists. And the Unionist government ran the place in such a way as to exclude the nationalist minority, Catholic, nationalist, Republican, until the whole place exploded in 1969. What followed was one of the largest conflicts in the history of the United Kingdom, with residents from both sides of the divide affected by the relentless battling and bloodshed. For 40 years, every child here knew the sound of a bomb. And some children could tell you the difference between an AK-47 and a British SA-80. The nationalists want to unite with the rest of the people in Ireland and be governed as a single entity in the island, whereas the unionists feel they will be overwhelmed in such a government and that their only security of maintaining themselves as an entity is the union with Britain. And if that union is threatened, they believe they will be overwhelmed. Remarkably, though, a political milestone was reached in the spring of 1998, which was to change everything. We had the signing of the Good Friday Agreement in April. 
which I think set a lot of people's minds at ease that here at last we don't need to worry anymore about bombings or shootings. Uh, we've got we've got peace, and that's as parents, that's what we were very happy about the fact that we didn't need to worry about our children when they went out. Four months on from this historical landmark, the people of Oma were enjoying a summer's weekend. Suzanne Travis was back home on a break from university. For some reason, we must have had a lazy morning and we just stuck our time. We had to go to town that day because my mum was taking me into the travel agents to get my ticket to go back to Liverpool in September. Um, and so we decided that we would just go in in the afternoon that day. We'd done the shopping, we came back home, and when I came into the kitchen, I said to my wife, 